Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Okay, well, th thank you so much, John. It's just great to be here, and I've had such a great time in Wellington so far learning about this city, and it uh, really is a biophilic city already in, in so many ways. Um, thank you for all of you who've had to have, uh, such a hand in, in hosting me. I want to thank the mayor, uh, who how we filmed in several uh, pla places, including Sunday, uh, with umbrellas and the rain pouring down, and you were so articulate, and... Uh, even in those uh, those conditions, and, and, and Charles and Amber Bill and all the amazing staff here uh, in the, the city of Wellington, it's just just incredible. So hopefully we'll have a chance to talk at the end a little bit more about uh, ways talk, talk about ways in which Wellington is uh, biophilic. So I don't have a very formal presentation. I should say, by the way, that I think this is the most impressive place I've ever spoken. This is really neat, and I feel like I sh we should take a vote on something, <laughs> Madam Mayor. No, all right, I can't, no, I'm just kidding. No, no. So, <laughs> it, has unanimous. it has to be unanimous, okay. Well, all right, so I don't have a very formal presentation, but I, just a few slides um, over about 45 minutes and a few stories to tell uh, about this concept of biophilia. Um, Charles already gave a little bit of a plug for this book, uh, Biophilic City. So, so I'm going to go very quickly, and if there are uh, projects and cities that seem of interest, there, there are places to find more information, one of them being this, this little book. As you could tell, it's not a very fat book yet. So part of this is an effort uh, to, to introduce this idea of biophilic cities and, uh, and to get us talking uh, about the ways in which nature can be creatively integrated into urban life. So that's one resource um, we are filming today. Um, and uh, my colleague, Linda Blagg, where are you? In the back somewhere filming this, actually. We've been, there will be uh, a film about biophilic Wel Wellington, we, we think. And so I've, I've become convinced of the power of film. And uh, for me, this started uh, several years ago with a documentary, documentary film called The Nature Cities. And if anyone would like a copy, I'm happy to give it to you, um, and a, a collaboration with a Colorado filmmaker. And some of the slides and some of the stories come from that, from that film. So this is the challenge, and Charles already set it up quite, quite well. We are an urban planet, an increasingly urbanized planet. And I'm an urban planner by training. Uh, planners love cities. We recognize that uh, we have amazing uh, sustainability challenges, and moving to, 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 to a, a, an urban planet is a good thing in the sense of our living more, uh, more compactly, um, uh, able to walk and, and rely on transit and, and uh, the ability to use things like energy and, and water and materials more efficiently. Really, cities represent our best hope for a sustainable future. So that said, um, how, how do we live in those cities uh, with the closeness to nature that we know we need. I'll elaborate on that a little bit. So just a few words about the, this Biophilic Cities project. There is a web page uh, you'd like to visit and add your name. We have, um, we have a monthly Biophilic Cities e-newsletter, uh, a weekly Biophilic Cities blog. As Charles mentioned, much of this project is about working with partner cities uh, around the world, uh, and, and we're just delighted that Wellington is one of those partner cities. And one of the things that we're, we're looking forward to is a, is a major launch event in Charlottesville, Virginia, my, at my university in October. So we're imagining this global biophilic cities network, network of, of, of cities around the world helping each other exploring how they can become more biophilic, and it's the, I'm delighted that we actually will have a delegation of, of folks from, from, from Wellington. So this is a screenshot of the, of the webpage, uh, so take a look there. So this is the idea. We have to give a lot of credit to E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson, um, biologist at Harvard, who uh, wasn't the first to use the term biophilia, but really coined it in the sense that, that we're using it today. So here's one of his definitions, biophilia the innately emotional affiliation of human beings to other living organisms. Innate means hereditary and hence part of ultimate human nature. So this idea, as Charles is saying, that we've lived just a tiny little bit of our evolutionary lives in cities and in buildings, that for us to be truly happy and healthy and to lead productive lives, we need to have contact uh, with, with nature. It's not optional. 
It's absolutely essential to, to leading uh, healthy and productive lives. So we're carrying with us our ancient brains. And the, the evidence is mounting that, that we really need that nature. And it's nature, not, uh, n not the kind of experience that you can get only uh, on a holiday during the summer or once a year or twice a year. That nature has to be everyday nature. It has to be all around us. We have to experience it, if not daily, hourly, really. So that's a challenge uh, for us, um, but uh, we have lots of uh, positive examples of, of cities that are, are, are doing it. Just a little bit of um, dwelling a little bit on the evidence because it's really uh, quite, quite convincing, I think. And it comes from lots of different fields of study. Some of you know about the, the, this long um, uh, research done by the Japanese around the, this concept of forest bathing. I love this, the idea walking through a forest and experiencing the, the dappled lights, the bird, bird sounds, the changing color, immerse, immersion in the forest, forest bathing. It's like bathing in, your, it's like bathing in the bathtub. Um, and, and not a big surprise, maybe, that the Japanese show pretty convincingly that at the end of that forest bathing, at the end of that walk in that forest, uh, stress hormone levels go down. The immune system gets a boost. We're happier. We're in a better mood. So uh, thinking about modern life, uh, we have lots of stresses and uh, lots of modern illnesses that are associated with long-term chronic, chronic stress. Nature is, is some of the best an antidote that we have uh, for that. I'm often arguing that uh, nature brings us together as a species. So there's a strong social element here. I sometimes talk about it in terms of nature's social capital. So these two women on the left um, made an appearance in the Nature Cities film. We, we went to San Diego uh, to tell the story of the canyons in that city. Some of you know San Diego has kind of developed in a way that jumped over a lot of the canyons. There are actually hundreds of these amazing, uh, really bi biologically rich canyons. And today, m many of them are uh, places where people don't go. Uh, there, there will be school kids and, and schools perched on the edge of these canyons, and the, and the school kids are told, don't go into the canyons, don't cross the canyons, don't, don't walk to school through the canyons, and they're, they're dangerous, and they're full of garbage, and they're places we... So, so there is quite a movement to rediscover those, those canyons. So the, we followed these two women around one day. They are amateur urban wildlife trackers. So they have gone to school to learn the finer points of distinguishing between the track, the tracks of a domestic cat, the paw prints of a domestic cat versus bobcat. And it turns out in this particular canyon, Rose Canyon, there's a resident female bobcat. So that day we followed these two women into the canyon. We could hardly keep up with them. Uh, at a certain point, they went off the trail. We followed them. They went into the, into the brushes. and. And uh, we couldn't, really couldn't keep up. And at a certain point, we heard this kind of yelping. And they were, yeah! And they, they were ecstatic because they had discovered some blood on a branch. And they, they concluded that they were just minutes behind the bobcat. That's the kind of excitement. But more importantly, they, they have this amazing friendship and this amazing bond. Um, so many things that we do in nature bring us together. And we know, actually, to be healthy, we need friendships. And we need deeper uh, friendships. And, and we have all of this evidence that mortality rates uh, uh, for cancer uh, go way down when you have deeper, fuller fr friendships. So the social realm is quite important. And the story one that we tell in this movie is about this, this canyon. And, and these two women will, will tell you that the neighborhoods that surround the canyon are quite different. So some of them, they're, they're higher density, multifamily neighborhoods and some single family. Uh, neighbor, neighbor, neighborhoods and neighbors who would probably not come together otherwise except for this canyon that brings them all together. Uh, and so the social realm is an important part of this uh, as well. We are an aging uh, planet in many ways and uh, we have to think about the, the importance, the value of, of nature uh, to an aging population. One of our partner cities uh, is Phoenix. And uh, this is Jane, Jane Rao, who, who is a, a, founding, a founder of this amazing McDowell Sonoran uh, Reserve and a, and a conservancy that manages this, this reserve. It's actually in Scottsdale, adjacent to the city of, of Phoenix. And 
uh, an amazing story. She's just turned 90 years old, and she goes out every morning, gets up at 4 in the morning. She's clearing trails. She's giving, guiding school groups into the desert. Uh, her, her physician, her, her, her doctor, uh, is quite happy about this uh, because her bone density has gone way up. Her weight is back to what it was in, in high school. She's healthy, and she's made friendships, and she has a sense of pur purpose. And, uh, and a full life because of this, this nature. 400 volunteer stewards basically manage this 17,000 acre uh, urban reserve. It's really quite a, a remarkable story. We have a lot of evidence that uh, greening urban neighborhoods helps to address things like crime. Some evidence from uh, a recent uh, University of Pennsylvania uh, study showing that in Philadelphia, in places where vacant lots have been greened, where they've planted trees, compared to those, those lots that, where, where that greening hasn't happened, crime rates go down. Gun violence uh, goes down. People feel better about uh, those neighborhoods. Uh, here's a little summary from one of the articles that presents the results of this study in the American Journal of, American Journal of Epidemiology. That's actually not quite right. But one story that we tell in the, uh, this documentary film, Nature of Cities, has to do with, uh, with bats in, in Austin, Texas. Some of you have probably heard this story, but uh, Merlin Tuttle here on the left, uh, the founder of Bat Conservation International, had a lot to do with, with helping the city of Austin, Texas become more biophilic. So this is a city that suddenly discovered, it, it went through a, a process of, of renovating the Congress Avenue Bridge. This is a major bridge in downtown Austin, Texas. And they discovered um, that suddenly the, the bridge was home to a million and a half Mexican free-tailed bats and became overnight virtually uh, the largest urban bat colony in the world. Well, um, the city's first reaction to this news, to this discovery, was, oh, it's a danger, a health hazard. We have to eradicate the bats. Well, uh, Merlin almost single-handedly, it's a longer story, almost single-handedly shifted the, the point of view, was able to convince the city that the bats weren't so bad after all. They had a lot of positive value, including, including man, you know, controlling pests and insects. Um, and, and eventually, uh, the city became, began to celebrate the bats. And I don't know how many of you have been to, to see the bats in the summer. So they're migratory, they, they arrive in the summer, uh, they take up residence under the, under the bridge, and then uh, people uh, wait hours ahead of time for the sun to go down and stand on the bridge and wait for the emergence of the bats as they go off to feed in these large columns. It's just spectacular. So Austin has uh, really become a biophilic city. And it, it, it's remarkable now how much love they have for the Mexican free tail bats. In fact, um, it, 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 all of these people going, millions of dollars actually in tourism revenue, people coming from all over the place to watch the bats in the, in the summer. There are three or four bat watching dinner cruises. <laughs> these, these boats that go up and down the lower Colorado River. They've named their hockey team the bats. They've gone a little bit bat crazy. In, in, in Austin, Texas, but it's a marvelous story of a city that's been transformed and that really has a spirit, a biophilic uh, spirit. And so now, the, the rest of the story is that, that uh, the, the Texas Department of Highways is designing all of their new bridges so that they are, they, the spars are just the right distance to accommodate bats. And they're winning, they're winning design awards for their bat-friendly bridge designs. That's how far uh, things have gone, how, how much change we've seen in, in Texas. Uh, a lot of very interesting evidence coming out of psychology, talking about this earlier today, um, experimental psychology showing, for example, that in the presence of nature, we are more likely to be generous. Nature helps us to be better human beings. I won't go through this, this study, but um, University of Rochester study. And, and studies that are now showing that we we score more highly on creativity uh, tests in the presence of nature. Even, even having the color green in the room uh, leads to an increase, uh, an increase in, our, in our creativity uh, scores. 
Um, that's a sulfur crested cockatoo, of course, on the right. I, mean, I lived for a while in, in Sydney. I probably shouldn't talk about Australia here, but. Um, <laughs> and, and one of the things that we discovered when we moved into our apartment was that a flock of cockatoo came to visit to see how generous we were going to be. And it was actually a part of the biophilic experience of living in Sydney. And, uh, and, and also the bats, gray-headed flying foxes that fill the sky. Um, so a lot of evidence uh, about the power of nature. And I could go on and on. Uh, it, it's really remarkable. So that said, there are lots of, of strong reasons why we, we really need that nature. We need to have it all around us. Uh, economic, uh, ecosystem services, um, we, we're facing climate change, adaptation, resilience, all those things are all, they're all benefits from having, having a city more full of nature. So how do we do this? So a, a lot of what we've been trying to do is think about the different ways that a city can be considered biophilic. So what is a biophilic city? It's going to de depend on the location. It's going to be different to, for different places, different parts of the world. Um, it clearly is, uh, it has to do with the presence or absence of nature, right? The physical environments of that place. This is an image of Helsinki. Uh, this idea of having a, a hierarchical, integrated network of nature and green spaces and, and natural spaces in the city. So one idea of a biophilic city uh, that you see in a place like Helsinki, that you, you ought to be able to walk out your door, out your flat, out your apartment, out your, your home, the front door of your home, have nature all around you, and then be able to walk to progressively larger amounts of nature as you move away from your home. So Helsinki is a terrific example of that. In fact, you can move from the very center of that city all the way out to old growth forest at the edge of that, of that city, and a, and a network, an interconnected uh, network of, of nature, green, green spaces. So in the book, um, there are a few um, examples of how of indicators of what ways we might uh, measure what a biophilic city uh, is. And that's, um, we're hoping that Wellington will help us and the other partner cities will help us to, to test some of these. And, and uh, just not to go into this in detail, this is actually a table or box from the book. Biophilic conditions and infrastructure is one category. Uh, we're becoming better in the field of planning at, at measuring and, and um, developing indices and tracking over time uh, changes in the physical environment. So uh, the, the percentage of, of, of tree canopy cover, for example, uh, is a 10 percent, 20 percent, 40 percent. We have an organization called American Forest that argues that that 40 percent, there ought to be all the, every city ought to have a minimum of 40 percent tree, tree canopy coverage. That's pretty, uh, pretty high. Is it is a percentage of land area uh, in some form of green? Is it some measure of the access that the urban population has to, to, to nature? So we have cities like New York and and other cities around the world that, that have that are indicating you know, have a, have some sort of aspiration. Everybody ought to be within a five to ten minute walk of a park or green green space. Uh, in Europe, there is this uh, this terrific program called the Green Capital Cities. One of our partner cities, Vittoria Gastez in Spain, uh, was last year's winner of the Green Capital City Award. They uh, require a lot of information, but one of the things they ask every city to calculate is what percentage of your population lives within 300 meters of a green space or park. That's one one measure. And in cities like Vittoria, it's 100, virtually 100%. So we're, 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 we become better at, at that. But there are other ways. It isn't just the presence or absence of nature. That's a big, a big part of it. How engaged in that nature are we? How, how, much, how much time are we spending out, outside? How much do we know about native flora and fauna? Can we recognize it when, when we see it? Are we participating uh, in, in, a, in a birding group or a native plants society? Are we engaged in um, urban restoration work. These are all really important measures of, of how biophilic that, that city is. So here's the second category, biophilic activities. Just mentioned some of those activities. Um, so we've got a, a terrific network of trails, but what percentage of the population actually is out there hiking using those trails? That's really important to know. Biophilic attitudes and knowledge. Again, how much uh, do we know about the nature around us? How engaged in it are we? How much do we care? about it. Uh, these are all really uh, important uh, measures. 
Uh, a final measure, uh, category measure, is biophilic institutions and governments, governments. So we're finding um, in many of these best cities that there are there sort of foundational things. So uh, if you have a, a natural history museum, that is often a kind of linchpin for, for um, programs about nature. One of our partner cities is Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin, and Milwaukee has just opened their third neighborhood-based urban ecology center. It's this idea of an ur urban ecology center focused in a neighborhood that becomes the, the place where you learn about the nature around you, and it becomes the place to, uh, to, 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 to uh, engage in bird watching, the place where schools uh, come to learn. Uh, that's really quite quite uh, important. The governance is also important. How much commitment? You clearly have a lot of commitment to nature in this city. What percentage of the municipal budget goes for the restoration, management, protection, um, education uh, about that that nature around you? We can we can measure those things. But we're trying trying to. So so there are some some indices, some some ways of thinking about it. Again, we, we tend to think a uh, biophilic city has to be a city, or primarily a city, that has a lot of nature. Uh, it may well be that there are cities that have not as much nature as other cities, but that, that care for that nature, that love that nature, that are engaged in that nature in, in a more actively. So it's not just the presence or absence. And, and what about the, back to the example of Austin, Texas, the spirit of biophilia. The, but how do we capture things like the, the extent to which a city is curious, curiosity, measuring things like curiosity? That's a challenge for us. Can we, can we activate in every city a culture of curiosity about the nature uh, around us? That's sometimes a hard thing um, to do. So um, back to the question, actually, that, Charles, you, you posed um, this in the title of the talk. Uh, is there a minimum level of nature that we need. Ah. <laughs> I'm only about a third of the way through, so I'm going to go faster, <laughs> I think. And in fact, we've, this Bafix Age project is, we've got funding from a couple of foundations, one of them called the Summit Foundation, based in Washington, D.C., and they, they supported us in part because they, they were intrigued by this idea that we would try to answer what is the minimum you know, daily <coughs> amount of nature we need? What's the minimum dosage? of nature that we need. There's a lot of talk now about vitamin N. Um, Richard Louv and others talk about the need for vitamin N. Or, and, 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 and so we're working on this, and we have a Delphi um, uh, study that uh, we're you know, going to be um, starting soon. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's an intriguing idea. We don't even know uh, what, what the measure of a dosage is of nature. <laughs> Uh, is a is a you know is a, a unit when that that bird flies by? Is it is it hearing that bird sing? Is it the bird? Is it five birds? Is it five birds a green roof and a green wall? Is it five birds a green roof a green wall and five trees? And a, what combination of things in the city uh, brings us that that minimum daily required nature? So um, this nature pyramid is one way that we've been thinking uh, about this. Um, this. This is actually. A, the idea came from a colleague of mine, Tanya Bankley Cobb, and we've been using it, flushing it out a little bit differently than she meant it. But, but this, do you have the, the food pyramid? Do you use that here in, in New Zealand? We're actually, it's a little irritating now, the U.S. Department of Agriculture is shifting to this, these, this plate concept where they show plates. But I like the pyramid. So the, the food pyramid being this you know, guidance about what you should eat, those things at the top of the pyramid being you know, things that may be good for us in small quantities, and we don't want a lot of them, but we need some of them, and we need to build our diet with those things at the base, those healthier things, fruits and vegetables and, and, and grains. But we think about the urban nature diet in a similar kind of way. So at the top, um, those, those visits on vacation, far away, maybe, uh, my part of the world, I'm often talking about the, the trip to the, the vacation in the rainforest in Costa Rica, you know, or the cloud forest. It's that, 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 you know, that, we don't want everybody doing that. The carbon footprint associated with nature that way is too large for our planet. So we've got to figure out what's at the base of our nature diet. And it, it is things uh, like urban birds, 
bird watching and, and, and green walls and green roofs and so on. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to challenge everybody to think about what, what are the, the sort of foundation blocks of a nature diet in, in Wellington. I think I know about some of them. So this uh, idea sort of caught on with some of our partner cities, and in Sing Singapore, one of our partner cities, and they they liked this idea, and they decided to, to develop their own Singapore-specific pyramid. So you see, uh, you know, native um, flora and fauna for, for for Singapore. So there's a native butterfly there, and, and images, vertical green structures, and and so on. And I often get this question. Uh, is this kind of like the Mediterranean diet? Are there different diets? And it depends on where you are, what city you're in. And, and maybe it is. It certainly it is. I mean, again, the, the nature diet in Phoenix, Arizona, in the desert, has to be different than the nature diet in Oslo, Norway, another one of our partner cities. So, uh, so that's a question that's kind of guiding a lot of this research. And I can't. Uh, tell you definitively what the answer is, but um, we're, at the end of it, we will hopefully have some answers. But we have a lot of challenges in cities, and I will go a little bit faster. One of them is this profound disconnect that we have from the nature around us. So for a number of years, uh, I was doing this, um, what I call the what is this survey. I would show uh, groups, um, a slideshow, slides of uh, native flora and fauna, native to, to my part of the world, and I would uh, ask people to tell me you know, what they see. Can they identify? I wasn't really looking for scientific names so much. Um, and uh, it's a, it was a little startling. We talked about this earlier today. It, it, at least in my part of the world, most people can't identify even common species of, of birds, plants, uh, trees. So that's a silver-spotted skipper. Uh, butterfly upper left, and, and I did this for several years, and I, I got all of maybe two correct answers in that time. Most uh, most of my American respondents uh, would say that, that that butterfly was a moth, and it looks like a moth, so I can sort of understand that. Uh, a lot of American respondents would say it was a monarch butterfly. It doesn't look anything like a monarch butterfly. And America, Americans seem to know only one kind of butterfly, and it's a monarch, even though we have 900 species or something. Uh, and I had two or three people tell me it was a hummingbird, which I thought was quite, quite creative, <laughs> quite, quite interesting. But we had no trouble at all identifying <laughs> corporate logos. Um, and at least in my part of the world, kids, of course, can identify the golden arches traveling in a 60 mile an hour car, you know, two a mile away. But that dragonfly or that damselfly that's right in front of them, and profoundly more important, a, a, a more important member of their community, they probably won't be able to identify. So we have some challenges. Um, and for me, biophilia, by the way, is multi-sensory. We have tended to privilege the ocular, the visual, but it's really all of the senses, and especially for me, sound. Um, so the, this, these are uh, sounds, nighttime sounds, actually, despite the image, from, from Virginia. So I uh, was in Europe earlier in the summer, returned home to the, the August sounds, and I could feel immediately um, more relaxed, and I, I was home. This is place-fixing, these are place-fixing sounds. You have them here. Uh, and, and so sound, soundscape is really quite important, but we don't, we don't even, we don't recognize generally the sounds that we hear. So what I said about that silver spotted skipper applies equally to many of the sounds. So by the way, we're working on sound, on a sound map in our community, and, and uh, we're working, we're uh, likely going to do one in Portland and some other cities that we've been working with, and it's a good exercise for every city to go, uh, go through. Um, do you hear that? Do you know what that is? It sounds like a horse, doesn't it? Sometimes this, this sound doesn't really, but this downward winning. I hear this uh, almost every night at home. Any guesses? What is it? Uh, could be, but no. This is the other part of the call. But is it it's a, a very common species of uh, a critter where I am, Eastern Screech Owl. Turns out, <laughs> Screech Owls don't screech, at least ours don't. Uh, but this downward winning, once you hear it, you never forget. Place fixing. It, it's very much a part of the, the biophilia of a place. But yet we don't know what we're listening to. 
Uh, my main point, though, is it's multi-sensory. So we've got to think about the soundscape as, as much as, as what we see, the visual realm. Um, and a couple summers ago, I spent, I spent part of my time in Australia reporting some of the Australian sounds and uh, came to love the, the Australian raven, which has the sound that it sounds like a baby crying. It's just amazing. And I'm mainly showing this to you because of this quote. Val, Val Plumwood uh, was an environmental ethicist and uh, a hero for a lot of us. And she talked about this idea of hearing sound as, as voice, voices. That's a profoundly different way of thinking about the, the, the sounds that we hear. It's actually a living creature, a co-inhabitant of, of, our, of our cities, uh, and a fellow citizen, if you, if you will, to paraphrase uh, Aldo Leopold. So, so sound is just as important uh, uh, as well. So in the, in the quick, um, in the little bit of time that I have left, whoops, I uh, just want to quickly show you some of the things that, that some of our other partner cities uh, are doing uh, to move in the direction of becoming more sustainable and more, more uh, biophilic. Uh, this is Luis uh, Arrive, who was the environment director for Victoria Castez, the capital of the Basque country in Spain. And he's standing in front of a new green vision for the city. So Victoria has this amazing green ring that circles this very compact, dense Spanish city. <coughs> Um, and and they're, they're trying to bring that nature into the center of the city. So they're actually calling it the interior green ring, which is a funny way to describe it, but it's captured the imagination of citizens. And their first project is to uh, bring a, a stream back to the surface, to daylight a stream that runs right through the, the center of this very compact uh, city. Very impressive. Oslo, two-thirds of the city is in protected forest, and their new green vision is to daylight and restore the eight, the eight rivers, the eight riparian areas that run from the forest to the fjord. It's an, it, it will be many years before they achieve this, but it's a, a remarkable vision for, for a city. They have an amazing <coughs> urban trail uh, system. This is one of the trail, one, one bit of the trail system on the left. It's hard to imagine they're just a few hundred meters from pretty dense urban, urban development. Nature very, very close to where people live. Uh, another of our partner cities is San Francisco. And San Francisco is probably um, the gold standard when it comes to reimagining small urban spaces and finding new ways to, to create parks. So one of their initiatives is called Street Parks. And this is something the public works uh, department in that city is spearheading. So these are median strips in the city where neighborhoods are, are given the chance to take them over. The only requirement is that they uh, develop a plan for how to use those spaces. And this is one example uh, of, a, of a playa park uh, right, on, right on the ocean. And this uh, uh, very narrow strip, uh, median strip, has become a place of nature. It's become a place where food is being grown. It's a gathering space for the neighborhood. And a really remarkable story. Um, the latest chapter, some of you know about the concept of parklets, um, and San Francisco has kind of pioneered this idea. A parklet is, is, is a space where you take two to three on-street parking spaces and convert them into a park. Wow, interesting. So there are a growing number of parklets. Um, Jane Martin has been a friend and supporter of our program, and she's designed uh, the parklet here, which you see, which is the first residential parklet. And it includes, you see the green elements, um, and including a vegetative dinosaur, which connects to the deeper geologic history of this, of this place. So parklets, and, and parklets now, the idea has been exported, and cities all over the world are, are similarly uh, doing it. Alleys, can we find ways to, to incorporate nature into existing, uh, the existing urban fabric in creative ways? So San Francisco has a Living Alley, Alley's program now. It just started, but it's been fascinating to watch uh, as they begin to incorporate, uh, they, they designate promising alleys in, in the area plans in their, in their planning. And this is an image from one of the early uh, one of the places where they tried to do this. But it's not just San Francisco, it's Chicago and, and Montreal and a number of other places. Montreal's become a bit famous for its, its green uh, alleys program, amazing spaces and behind houses and um, again, community gathering spots and, and a lot of nature. 
Uh, Portland, Oregon is uh, one of our partner cities as well. They have now a thousand green streets. So they're uh, emphasizing this idea of greening the city, but also finding ways to capture, to, to uh, collect and, and, and treat on site stormwater falling on the city. So every curb extension, every median strip is a chance to collect water. This is um, uh, Linda Dobson, who heads the stormwater program in, in Portland. And she's standing in, in the lobby or in the uh, interior of a very interesting apartment building where all the water that falls on that site is, is kept on site and it's circulated through a series of, of meanders and public art features and, and uh, I, we're told that when it rains, residents come out to listen, listen to the rain, it's wild folk. So Milwaukee I've mentioned already, this is, these are images actually from this recently opened third uh, neighborhood based uh, ecology, urban ecology center, and part of it actually is a very uh, impressive, this is a rendering, of uh, a section of the Menominee River, which they are going to be restoring, and it will have community gardens, and it will have uh, native habitat restoration, and, and uh, Milwaukee's a bit famous for its river protection, river conservation uh, efforts. I mentioned Singapore. How do we create vertical cities? Um, many places, many parts of the world we know we're going to have to live in a more vertical environment and, and Singapore uh, is a city where most people are living in high-rise buildings. What, how can we have nature there? Well, that city has been, been leading the way, so they've created a sky-rise greening division within their parks department to help foster the <coughs> urban greening, vertical greening projects. Um, one of the things they're famous for is this 180-kilometer uh, network of park, parks connectors. Much of it, these are these are elevated. Much of it is elevated. Um, these are canopy walks that connect major parks, connect major uh, points of urban density with with uh, parks. Singapore is interesting because they've grown by several million in the last decade. At the same time. The percentage of land cover in green, green, green and vegetation has actually gone up. The same time the population has gone. Up. So they've, they've figured out how to do it. And there's the Landsat map that, that shows that. Um, Linda and Peter Newman and I did some filming. There's, there's actually a, a film about Singapore uh, on, on YouTube, right, Linda? Yeah. If you just Google Singapore Biophilic City, you will you will find it and tell, tell some amazing stories, including the story of this school, uh, where the students and, and a teacher uh, designed and built their own spectacular green wall. I don't have an image of it here. This is the fernery um, in this school. Uh, but lots of amazing stories uh, in that in this very vertical city. So in this city, figuring out how that green can happen, you know, in a high-rise building. Well, it can happen on the balcony. It can happen, people can be growing food in, in uh, windowsills. Uh, now they have a policy, <coughs> basically, and I need to stop. <laughs> I'm getting very close to the last slides, I promise. Uh, so this is a project called Solaris on the, on the left. It's a Ken Yang design uh, building, and it, it, it's wrapped by this, this vertical forest that is a, a kilometer and a half, continuous kilometer and a half around around the building. So buildings are now being built in a way that adds more green space, more nature than is taken away. Uh, that's the measure, at least in a vertical city, we need to be thinking about. This is a, 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 an American, a recent American example. Via Verde, uh, a high density um, public housing project or affordable housing project in the Bronx in New York. Uh, it's a story in itself. It's, a, uh, it's got a, a tiered a roof system all the way up to 20 stories, and on the third floor is an evergreen forest, on the fourth floor is an orchard, on the fifth floor are raised bed gardens, and then sedum green roofs all the way to the top, virtually all the way to the top of the, 20, to the 20th story, in a place uh, adjacent to uh, public transit and, and contributing to infill and the vibrancy of that, of that, of that city. So, okay, I'm, I'm out of time. There are a lot of other things that you can do in a city, and a lot of it, again, is, is the programmatic side. Uh, we need to be incorporating nature in, into schools, and many of these uh, partner cities are doing that in impressive ways. This is one program back to, to San Diego, Kids in the Canyons, re, rediscovering, reintroducing that nearby nature. 
Uh, we've just done some interviews with this. Uh, there's a group in uh, Florida and North Carolina called the School of Ants, uh, where kids are encouraged to collect ants and identify those ants. It's, it's a citizen science uh, project and pretty amazing story. I've become a big fan of uh, ants, ants in the, in the city. I don't have time to tell you too much about it. Uh, back in San Francisco, uh, they first um, school district in the country, maybe the world, uh, to, to have started a core of, of education outside, which is this a service learning uh, program. It's kind of like AmeriCorps. Uh, newly minted college students um, spend a year, for two years actually, um, in, in this sort of outdoor education environment attached to a particular school and then adopting a park or natural area nearby. Uh, really amazing story. Okay, I've come to the end. Again, I would say take a look at the website. We have um, lots of uh, additional information about the partner cities and uh, about what we're doing. And please add your, add your name to the email list and we'll send you more information, including the, uh, the, e, the monthly e-newsletter. E so that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, do we still have some time, maybe, for, for questions and discussion? And if not, I can... I'm happy to hang around. Thank you.